In this video, what I'd like to do is look at what happens to our kinematic uh, quantities and measures for deformation when the deformation is small in some very particularly well-defined situation. And what we're going to see is that the finite deformation relationships that describe different types of strains, etc., simplify greatly when we have the small strain case. And the small strain case really is the case that occurs in many, many engineering contexts. It's only when you have very large deformations, ones that you can actually see with your eyes, that there actually has been a motion of a system, that you have to worry about finite deformation. Otherwise, for a lot of standard engineering, the small strain case is the one that is most applicable. So let's just simply start by recalling the green strain expression. That's equal to 1 half C minus 1, where C is the right Cauchy green deformation tensor, which F transpose F. So if I can just plug that in that way. And let me go ahead and expand a little bit further. If I plug in for F and note that F is equal to the identity plus H, where H is the gradient of U, so they're just simply the, the derivative of the components of the displacement vector with respect to the position vector capital X, then I have this relationship 1 half identity plus H transpose times identity plus H minus identity. I can expand this out. And what we see is that the green strain is 1 half h plus h transpose plus h transpose h. So if we look at this, we have a term that is linear in h, a term that is linear in h, and a term that is quadratic in h. And now if, if h is small, in other words, the components of the displacement gradient are small, the last term, the H transpose H term, is going to be small in comparison to the first two terms, H and H transpose. So we should be able to simply just throw away those last terms there. And so if the components of H are much, much less than 1, then the green strain is essentially 1 half H plus H transpose. So this is what we call the small strain case. Sometimes it's also called the infinitesimal strain case. Technically, it's really the case where the displacement gradient components are small. So if things like 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6, that would easily be the small strain case. Even 10 to the minus uh, 3 is not so far from the small strain case. Uh, now really what I've done here, if you think about it in a formal sense, is what, what I've done is I've linear li linearized the expression for the green strain about the point where the displacement gradients are equal to zero. And if I want to sort of look at this in a more formal way, I can think about linearizing a function. So if I have any function f of y, its linearization about any point, let's say y naught, is given to me by this relationship here. And it's easier to kind of look at this graphically. This is just simply point slope form for a line. So I think about a function f of y and then I evaluate it at some location, why not? And what I'm trying to do is find the equation for the straight line that passes through f why not, why not, and is tangent to the actual function here. And the relationship that gives you that is the first two terms of the Taylor series, which I've written out here in this slightly cryptic form, but all this really is are, is the first two terms of the Taylor series. And in the case of linearization with respect to displacement gradient components that are really small, what we're thinking about is linearizing about the point where y naught is equal to 0 and y is equal to h. So if I, if I plug in these... Uh, relations here into the expression that I have for the general linearization of any function, what I'm looking at is the linearization of f with respect to h is equal to the valuation of the function at h equals 0, and then the derivative of f evaluated on alpha h evaluated for alpha equals 0. So it's kind of a compact relationship that allows me to linearize anything with respect to the displacement gradient. So in particular, f can be a scalar function like I've drawn in the graph up there, but it could also be a tensor-valued function. This would still hold. So let's go ahead and look at that case, and maybe we go ahead and start by looking at 
the uh, right Cauchy Green deformation tensor, which is given to me by these two terms here. So that's C as a function of H. And let's go ahead and formally linearize that relationship and see what we get as a first example here. So if I want the linearization of C about H equals zero, I evaluate C at zero, and then I take the derivative of the expression for C, but now I'm gonna stick in for H, I'm gonna stick in alpha H here. So I'll take the derivative with respect to alpha and then set alpha equal to zero. If I go through that exercise, C evaluated to zero is the identity, and out of the last term with the derivative, I'll get H plus H transpose. So that's one example of linearizing uh, one of our kinematic quantities, in this case, the right Cauchy green uh, deformation tensor with respect to the displacement gradient. You can see it's linear in H, which is what we expect. Uh, if I wanna linearize the green strain, I have to linearize one half C minus the identity. And what that's gonna give me then is one half identity plus H plus H transpose. So this is just the linearization about the zero of C. And then I have the minus identity here goes along. So the, that identity is gonna cancel with this other identity here. And that's gonna give me one half H plus H transpose. Uh, this quantity comes up quite a bit. We're gonna call it little epsilon. Uh, and it's known as the small strain tensor or alternately it's known as the infinitesimal strain tensor. Those are synonyms for each other. So epsilon is the symmetric part of the displacement gradient. So you take the displacement gradient, add it to, add it to its transpose, and divide by two. Uh, an interesting fact is that if I try and linearize the BO strain, or I try and linearize the Henke strain, I'll also get epsilon, the exact same small strain tensor, one half H plus H transpose. In fact, all nonlinear uh, strain tensors, when you linearize them, uh, you should get the small strain tensor epsilon. And, and so that, that kind of makes it nice. So in, in small deformation cases, there's only one strain tensor that you ever have to worry about. Uh, in component form, uh, it's a second order tensor, so I can write epsilon ij. And if I expand it out, it's one half ui comma j plus uj comma i. And expand it out a little bit more to, to remember what the common notation is that just says one half the derivative of ui with respect to xj plus the derivative of uj with respect to xi. So this is how you linearize the strain tensor and it doesn't matter which one you linearize, you, you will always get epsilon uh, one half h plus h transpose. We can also formally linearize all the other expressions that we had uh, for various types of strains and kinematic quantities. So for instance, uh, well, let's just start with the, with the tensor U, the right stretch tensor. If I linearize that, that is identity plus epsilon. I could linearize the rotation that comes out of the polar decomposition. That also depends on the displacement gradient. That'll give me the identity plus the skew part of H. And the skew part of H is one half H minus H transpose. So the only difference here is this minus sign uh, from when we defined epsilon, the small strain tensor. Uh, the quantity one half H minus H transpose is usually denoted with the symbol omega, and it's known as the infinitesimal rotation tensor. So we can write identity plus omega as the linearized part of R. Another interesting quantity that to know how to linearize is the Jacobian. So the determinant of f, if I linearize that with respect to h, I'm gonna get one plus the trace of epsilon. So we see that the trace of epsilon represents the volumetric strain because j minus one is the volumetric strain, j being the volumetric stretch. So written out a little bit more carefully. So the, if I linearize about h equals zero, lambda vol, meaning the volumetric stretch, minus one, so I have the volumetric strain, then I end up with trace epsilon. I can also linearize the area strain. So the area strain is the area stretch minus one. If you 
go through that process of linearization for small displacement gradients, you get identity minus n outer product n double contracted with epsilon. So n is the normal to the area of interest. So you pick an area of interest by its orientation, and then you evaluate the strain at that point. And this relationship now gives you the area strain. So it's a little bit simpler. You don't need to calculate JF inverse transpose. You just calculate epsilon, and then you hit it with this tensor identity minus orientation outer product orientation. Uh, if we want to do line elements, we can look at the stretch in a direction n. Uh, and if we subtract 1 from it, we'll get the strain in that direction. And the linearization, about 0 displacement gradient, will give us the direction n dotted with epsilon acting on n. So this also has a nice interpretation then is if n is associated with one of the coordinate axes, then what we see is that the diagonal elements of epsilon, the small strain tensor, correspond to the normal strains in the coordinate directions. We can also linearize the expression for the engineering shear strain, so gamma. And if I do that about uh, h equals 0, I'll get n dotted with 2 epsilon m, where n and m are any two orthogonal vectors. And I'd like to know the shear strain associated with those two vectors. Uh, again, if I pick n and m to be coordinate axes, then I see that the linearized shear strain is simply the off-diagonal terms or twice off-diagonal terms of epsilon. So let's suppose n is equal to ei and m is equal to ej, i not equal to j, then the linearized part of the shear strain associated with these two directions is going to give me 2 epsilon ij. So we get the off-diagonal terms multiplied by 2 give us the engineering shear strain here. The actual components here, the off-diagonal components of epsilon are sometimes called the tensorial shear strain components. So this is sort of a catalog of important linearized expressions uh, that we can use whenever we're in the situation where the, the magnitude of the displacement gradient components are all small which is a very common case in many engineering analyses.